showed up yesterday. I figured I'd do a recorded session here and post it. That way and you guys can watch this at your leisure. We'll talk about water potential today and close out topic two. Cells have cell membranes that allow them to establish and maintain internal environments that are different from their external environments. An important concept there is concentration gradient. What is concentration gradient? It is the difference in solute concentration from two different areas. So here we have um, a high concentration, and over here we have a low concentration. And particles will naturally move from high concentration to low concentration, just like a ball will roll down a hill, or if you let something go, it always falls towards the earth. Concentration gradient is going to dictate the majority of the movement here. So if you know the concentration gradient, you can uh, predict the movement um, most of the time. All right. Different types of transport a review here. Passive versus active. We'll be talking about passive with water potential. Passive transport is when molecules move from high concentration to low concentration. It's important to remember that the uh, solute concentration is going to dictate this, how much sugar or salt is in the environment. So water moves by osmosis from areas of higher water potential or low osmolarity, um, which would be low solute concentration, to areas of low water potential or high osmo osmo osmolarity or high solute concentration. I always think of it as water moves to the salty side or to the sugary side. If you put something in really salty or really sugary water, water is going to move to that side. Here's the formula for water potential. You will be given this. Let's see if we can zoom in on that. Uh, you'll be given this. The uh, Greek letter there is psi. So the what letter for water potential is psi. For pressure potential, it's psi sub p. For solute potential, it's psi sub s. Pressure is how much actual pressure there is in that um, cell. Remember that a beaker, an open beaker to the atmosphere is going to have a pressure potential of zero. All right, explain how osmoregularity mechanisms contribute to the health and survival of organisms. So this is going to be how organisms can take in um, water. For example, roots have to have a lower water potential than the surrounding soils. All right, so here is a question. Let's do a question in terms of balance. Um, osmoregulation maintains water balance and allows organisms to control their internal solute composition or water potential. So here's a scenario. We have a diagram here. I always try to figure out the diagram first, see what's going on. We have distilled water. Distilled water is pure water. Pure water has a water potential of zero. Water potential of zero. Um, in an open container also means that it has a pressure potential of zero. So what I'd like you to do here is answer these three questions. You can pause the video as you need to. Uh, I'll read them and answer them as we go. What is the water potential of the beat core in beakers A and B? What is the direction of movement of water in beaker B? And if a student adds solute to beaker A, how will that change the net movement of water and why? So pause the video and answer those questions. Welcome back. Hopefully you got these three answers. Um, to solve the water potential of the beat core, um, based on the given information, all you have to do is find the total of pressure potential plus solute potential. And if you go back to your formula, water potential equals pressure plus solute. So that's pretty easy. So for answer number one, you should have found that the beat core in beaker A, since it has a pressure potential of 4 and a solute potential of negative 4, it has a total water potential of 0. It has a total water potential of 0 in the beat core. And for the beat core in uh, beaker B, it has a pressure potential of negative, or excuse me, a pressure potential of 2 and a solute potential of negative four, so it has a water potential of negative two. So the question was just to answer what is the solute potential plus the water potential for each of those two B cores. Pretty straightforward. Question two says, what direction will water move in beaker B? 
And if you have a situation where you have a difference in water potential from one side of the cell um, to the solution on the outside, you're going to have movement. Water's going to move from high water potential to low water potential. And one of the, the ways students sometimes mess this up is because you can have a negative number here. Negative 2 is a lower number than 0. So water is going to move from 0 to negative 2. It's going to move from the higher number to the lower number. Distilled water has a solute potential of 0 and an open container of a pressure potential is 0. Therefore, the water potential in beaker B is 0. So if I wrote that here, the beaker has a, um, why can't I write? Oh, well. The beaker here has a water potential of zero. The beat core has a water potential of negative 0.2. Right? So which direction will water go? Water's going to go from the solution to the beat core. Water will move into the beat core and it will gain mass or it will gain water weight. So this solution here is not at equilibrium whereas this one would be because both the pressure or both the water potential of the solution and the water potential of the beat core are the same and therefore there's no net movement. Question three says if a student adds solute to beaker A how will that change the net movement? Well if you add solute here how is that going to, so imagine there's a bunch of little salt particles in here now, and what is that going to do to solute potential? Anytime you add solute, you are going to make the water potential lower. Adding solute lowers the water potential. Lowering the water potential will mean that the movement is probably going to go to that side. So in this situation, the water surrounding this, the beat core has now been lowered and water will move out of the beat core. It will lose mass or it will lose weight uh, or water. All right, we've touched on these types of transports before. Uh, describe the process that allows ions and other molecules to move across the membrane. That's where we see um, there's really a couple different ways this happens. Ions are rarely going to move directly across the membrane. Why? Because they're charged. Charged things are going to avoid this hydrophobic layer. Um, so simple diffusion for ions is probably not going to work. Ions could definitely move through protein channels from high concentration to low. That would be um, passive transport or facilitated diffusion. Ions can also move against the concentration gradient with the help of ATP, but also through proteins. That's active transport. And they can move through endocytosis and exocytosis, which we covered on earlier. Um, compartmentalization. Describe the membrane-bound structures of the cell. We, we did this the other day, but membrane, membrane and membrane-bound structures, uh, organelles, and eukaryotic cells, they compartmentalize um, the cell, meaning they allow for different rooms for cells to be um, have specific reactions or uh, specific conditions. This is certainly important when we talk about proteins. Certain proteins will work at different pH levels um, or enzymes need to be um, restricted to certain areas so they don't digest all over the cell. Internal membranes facilitate cellular processes by minimizing competing interactions. You can put things in specific environments and control the substrates and the products. Uh, also having smaller internal organelles means you're going to have a high surface area to volume ratio, which means you're going to have better reactions or more efficient reactions. Um, all right, I want to do a practice question here. Let's see if we can blow this up. Um, here is a sample question. There we go. You can see this should look a little familiar. Let's look at the diagram. We've got a phospholipid bilayer, really a fluid mosaic model. We, it doesn't really matter what, which side is inside or in the membrane or out, but we've got this boundary here, definitely a protein channel. So this is either going to be active transport or facilitated diffusion. Um, 
and we can see the phospholipid bilayer. Remember that this section here is um, this section here is the hydrophobic layer. It's non-polar. Trying to figure out how to do this. And then the sides up here are going to be polar. I don't know why I did that. All right. <clears throat> Describe the biological need for cells to be surrounded by a membrane that is selectively permeable for different materials. Explain how the model shows selective permeability of the membrane to specific ions. Describe the characteristics of the phospholipid bilayer that permits small hydrophobic lipid molecules to pass directly across the membrane. And based on the model, explain whether the molecules shown crossing the membrane require energy or do not. So pause the video and see if you can answer those four questions. All right, welcome back. Hopefully you've got answers to those. Describe the biological need for cells to sur be surrounded by a membrane. Um, cells have uh, the biological need in that they need certain materials to come through and need to hold certain materials out. Different cells have different requirements. So in a multicellular organism, you're going to have certain molecules come into cells based on specific ion channels or the shape of these proteins or the chemistry of these proteins that allow for only certain ones to come in as needed. The cell membrane is selectively permeable and it will um, control what comes in and comes out based on the configuration of that membrane. The more protein channels it has, the more those ions are going to be able to come through. Um, so your answer should reflect an understanding of what is selective permeability. Certain things come through, certain things don't come through, and if the cells need things to come through, they're going to have to have special structures that do that, protein channels specifically for facilitated and active transport. Explain how the model shows selective permeability of the membrane to specific ions. Well, here we've got uh, some ions that are shown. They're different because we're shown that they're different. It says specific water-soluble ions, meaning that they're not exactly identical. The gray ones and then the ones that have the little dash marks on them. And this protein channel only allows the gray ones to come through. So therefore, you see that it is specific to those ones. So the fact that only certain ions come through indicates that this is selectively permeable. Describe the characteristics of the phospholipid bilayer that permit small hydrophobic lipid molecules to pass directly across. Here we have small hydrophobic. How do we know that these are hydrophobic? Because they are lipid. Lipid, um, lipid soluble molecules means they're going to be hydrophobic. In other words, they'll be nonpolar. Things that are small, nonpolar, will pass directly to the membrane because they are not held by this hydrophobic layer, they interact with it, they are not repelled by it. Remember that the hydrophobic layer will repel the water soluble and the polar molecules like water or ions. Based on the model, explain whether the molecules shown crossing the membrane require energy or do not. Well, you got to look at the direction of movement. Is the direction of movement from high to low or low to high? So if you're looking at this, and you're, wanting to, you're wondering, well, okay, well, this side is high. How do I know that this side is the high concentration side? Well, there are more molecules up here, at least in this snapshot, than there are down here. If this side is high, it has to be high relative to the other. So you can't just look at one side. You're comparing the two sides. Which side has the high uh, concentration? Which side has the low? What is the arrow showing? The arrow is showing movement from high to low. Therefore, this is passive transport, no energy required. All right, uh, and that goes back up to here. Remember that the net movement of these particles will always be in this direction here, down the concentration gradient. All right, that pretty much gets us to the end of section two. Um, or topic two. So the last one is the origin of... Um, eukaryotic cells. So this one here talks about the endosymbiotic theory. Cell membrane bound organelles evolved from free living prokaryotes via endosymbiosis. So that would be where one cell consumes another cell but does not digest it. Um, what's the evidence for this? Well prokaryotes lack this internal structure 
Um, they have specific sized ribosomes and their DNA is um, uh, circular, not linear like eukaryotes. And these organelles um, that, that are found in eukaryotic cells like the mitochondria and the chloroplast, they have DNA in them and ribosomes in them that looks like uh, prokaryotic DNA and prokaryotic ribosomes. Eukaryotes maintain internal membranes that uh, we said, remember, um, control specific reactions. So compartmentalizing a cell means you increase surface area to volume ratio. You can compartmentalize um, reactions so you're not mixing up reactants. Think about your house as organized in specific rooms. You don't do the same things you do in the kitchen that you do in the bathroom. That would be bad. Uh, and then membrane-bound organelles um, probably arrived from free-living prokaryotic cells that were consumed by um, eukaryotes. And that's the end of topic two. I'm going to put out a topic three video, and we'll have some more review sessions. So that's what I got. See ya.